Thank you for attending. I'll start by saying that this paper is a shortened form of an academic article by the same name, which has since been published in the Museum of Science Fiction's Journal of Science Fiction. The term Anthropocene was coined in the year 2000, under the assumption that our official geological epoch, the Holocene, no longer accurately describes life on Earth in the context of the vast, planetary-level changes which humanity, or Anthropos, is causing to the natural world we live within. Although the term is yet to gain formal recognition, it's become a key term in academic and public ecological discourse in recent years. If we accept that we are living within the Anthropocene epoch, it becomes imperative to interrogate the value judgments that underpin our societies. As I shall proceed to demonstrate, the speculative futures of the American author Paolo Bacigalupi succeed in communicating the immediacy of the Anthropocene through an embodied paradigm. Horrifying anthropogenic phenomena, such as the devastating Australian bushfires of 2019 and early 2020, the continuing devastation of the Amazon rainforest and the zoonotic COVID-19 pandemic are increasingly frequent and escalating disasters that can be construed through the lens of our own bodies. As Emma Rees states in her introduction to the volume Talking Bodies, language fails in the face of embodiment, the visceral rapidly surpasses the linguistic. Consequently, the embodied subjectivity of the human body comprises a more effective vehicle for communication than language itself. I contend that the American author Paolo Bacigalupi's works gesture beyond language in precisely this manner, via their figuration of what we can term novel bodily economies. By situating otherwise distant and unfathomable visions of the anthropogenic apocalypse in the bodily realm, Bacigalupi makes the alarming visions of his science fiction viscerally contemporary. Bacigalupi's novel bodily economies expose the insufficiencies of familiar language in describing our anthropogenic present and future, and resituate the body and its phenomenological apparatuses as a principal site of anthropocene communication. However, the economic component of Bacigalupi's speculative bodily economies is just as crucial, as is patent in discourses about the anthropocene. Naomi Klein elucidates that in the drive to reverse ever-rising carbon dioxide emissions, our economic system and our planetary system are now at war. Our economy is at war with many forms of life on Earth, including human life. As GDP-led economies are anathema to environmental pursuits, Klein is unequivocal that the measures we must take to secure a just, equitable and inspiring transition away from fossil fuels clash directly with our reigning economic orthodoxy at every level. New economic conceptions and metrics will prove necessary in the Anthropocene, either as a result of proactionary measures or compulsorily as a means of survival upon a scarcely inhabitable planet. By envisioning this systemically inexorable shift in embodied consciousness through a diverse range of novel bodily economies, Bacigalupi's novels detail a range of post-capitalist economic systems in an anthropogenic paradigm. In this light, his speculative bodily economies foreground humankind's embedded role within the Earth's ecologies, demonstrate the pitfalls and opportunities of novel economic paradigms, and depict the difficulties of implementing alternative economies as a workable alternative to GDP-led capitalist economies. Bacigalupi's speculative figuration of bodily economies therefore delineates a range of ulterior post-capitalist economies, whilst concurrently employing the viscerality of bodies to ground grotesque anthropogenic visions within an intelligible paradigm. For the purposes of concision, I'll proceed to demonstrate that, as is plain in his 2015 novel The Water Knife, novel bodily economies are pivotal components throughout Bacigalupi's over. The Water Knife is set in a future phoenix, affected by endemic water scarcity. The economic model of the Texas America is comprehensively centred upon water, to the extent that western states openly and violently compete between themselves to attain water rights to the Colorado River. In the world of the text, any state capable of producing water rights superior to those of neighbouring states can annex aquatic assets worth billions. Hence the consolidation of aquatic resources has become far more meaningful than the pursuit of capital. As a result of this comprehensive shift in the country's economic ambitions, states have become adversaries, readily willing to enact suffering on rival populaces, when doing so helps to preserve their own. For all western states, the Colorado River is a precarious lifeline, always threatened and always vulnerable to drying up. Its resources are unable to provide sustenance for all of their populations. Resultantly, fluid metaphors permeate the vernacular of their populaces, making the image of water eerily omnipresent in light of its literal scarcity. A person inexperienced in the everyday violence of life in Phoenix is either wet and soft, or capable only of seeing the world cloudy. Meanwhile, tenacious survivors are icy, and it's an erudite accomplishment to see the world clear in all of its horrific corporeality. Even when they are ostensibly discussing other matters, the high prevalence of water metaphors and casual conversations reminds residents of western states that all matters pertain to that necessary, yet now rare, means of sustenance. As the evolution of the language implies, the brutal realities of the novel's character's new bodily economy divorce them so far from our own time, characterised by environmental apathy and ignorance, I'd suggest, that the vocabularies of the two eras are fast becoming mutually exclusive. 
The text novel Bodily Economy is accordingly a mindset as much as it is a physical practice, a new means of conceptualising the positionality of the human body in an ecologically devastated world, and a radical rewriting of our own entirely insufficient frames of ecological reference. In this light, Bacigalupi specifically emphasises just how absolutely crucial water is to all aspects of human existence. In the text Transformed Phoenix, state-funded toilet cubicles roam the streets perpetually, ferrying piss and shit into remaining water treatment plants, trying to keep disease down with functioning sewer lines gone. Likewise, sweat can now be said to entirely encompass a body's history compressed into jewels, a new means of status, and the only one which ultimately matters in this parched landscape. Whoever endeavours to stay hydrated has to sweat for it first, and this severe feedback loop of borrowed time accordingly comprises the basis of a bodily economy into which Phoenix's citizens are invariably interpolated. Every individual must recycle every drop of their body's fluid that they can. Hence, technological innovations in the water knife only ever supplement the bodily economies of its diegetic world, and they therefore play a comparatively auxiliary role in its character's adaptation to their anthropogenic environment. Demonstrably, the transition into this new economic paradigm was a tangible culture shock. People started out squeamish about clear sacks, but eventually even the fussiest were grateful for them. And we might here, of course, consider our own changing familiarity with face masks over the course of 2020 and 2021. As Bacigalupi insinuates, although the major economic recalibrations necessary to survive in the Anthropocene will require us to become attuned to significantly abnormal configurations of embodied life, economic and lifestyle adaptation are inevitable if our species is to survive at all. Bacigalupi thus implicates the real-world Central Arizona project, 300 miles of canal system, all taking water to a burned-out city in the middle of a blazing desert, in its text, in order to demonstrate the results of our contemporary hubris. As a result of their anthropocentric presumptions, our contemporary economic policies have been responsible for engendering the violent social collapse of the text Future Phoenix. Implicated in the water knife in this manner, the CAP is symbolic of the vast amount of hubris that our societies are built upon. Its figuration emphasises that our ignorance of the embeddedness of human bodies in the planet's ecologies will inevitably prove fatal. Bachgalupi takes Mark Reisner's assertion that such ill-conceived American projects are a vandalisation of both our natural heritage and our economic future, for which the reckoning has not even begun as a means of demonstrating that the text's parched hellscape is an environment that is rapidly becoming real. In Bachelupi's description of the collapse of the Blue Mesa Dam following Californian sabotage, people with specks on the edges of the dam, all fleeing. The scale was almost too big to understand, the people tiny besides the jetting waters that blasted through the dam under pressure. Any anthropocentric delusions held by the characters who witnessed this natural manifestation of such raw power are stripped away in a moment. The transient value of individual human bodies becomes utterly plain, in the face of the enduring puissance of water. One pervasive aspect of Phoenix life in the text is the body lotteria, a daily sweepstakes that allows residents to gamble upon the city's homicide rate that day, in which over 150 is a perfectly reasonable bet. As this macabre form of entertainment makes plain, the only viable way for individuals to profit within the stark realities of the city's novel bodily economy is upon the misfortunes of others. Yet as Bachelupi implies, his readers profit by similar means, we all but sacrifice the bodies of our descendants by continuing to wreak environmental destruction upon the earth for our own short-term gain. To the same extent, when colonists set out to make the future of the American West secure, what they really did was make themselves rich, and their descendants insecure. Bachelupi's analogy is clear. As our own economic systems do, Phoenix allows only a few human bodies to profit from the misfortunes of a multitude of unseen others. For instance, the impacts of anthropogenic climate change are being, and will continue to be, manifested to a disproportionate extent in the global south. The loss of future generations through our selfishness is literalised in the text, since conditions have become so bad that many people now just gave up and sold their children. In the text time frame, there is no escape from the anthropogenic milieu of the city, since the very air of Phoenix is heavy with the char of faraway forest fires and the dust of dead farms. Hence its populace must constantly inhale the effects of theirs and their ancestors' disregard for the earth, to the sobering extent that the human environmental failures have become physicalised pollutants of the human body. In harsh contrast, the pyramid-like, sheltered and self-sufficient arcologies of the novel are populated by ferns and waterfalls and coffee shops, and are thus inordinately desirable residences. For the dispossessed, these towering arcologies are impenetrable, almost mythical places where the fluid and atmospheric concerns etched into the fabric of their daily lives in Phoenix would be erased in a moment, if only they were able to gain residence there. Therefore, the desire to attain housing permits within an arcology is the impetus that keeps many of the city's residents labouring day after day. It's precisely this desire for the alleviation of the incessant precarity that they experience on a daily basis which prevents the complete collapse of Phoenix's stagnant economy. Nevertheless, as a direct result of their exacerbation of extant class inequalities, the discrete environs of the arcologies demonstrate the principles of an incredibly successful bodily economy in miniature. 
Since each arcology is exhaustively defended by armed security guards, its abundant water supply belongs to a closed ecology, which is inaccessible to outsiders. The principles of their design are conspicuously redolent of Kate Raworth's donut model of economics, which proposes that the linear processes which underpin industrial economies are fundamentally flawed because they run counter to the living world, which thrives by continually recycling life's building blocks in natural cycles. Correspondingly, each arcology is capable of running on its own water for up to three months at a stretch without even having to dip into the Colorado River by running sewage water through filters and mushrooms and reeds and into lily ponds and carp ponds and snail beds so that by the time it comes out the other end, that water is cleaner than what they pump up from underground. Irrefutably, the non-anthropocentric bodily economy that the arcologies comprise is far more successful than the anthropocentric ones found elsewhere in the text and elsewhere in Bachelupi's Auvers. As this paper is demonstrated as true in The Water Knife, Bachelupi's Auvers implores the necessity and urgency of systemic economic change. A well-publicised statistic reveals that approximately half of all carbon dioxide emissions can be attributed to the richest 10% of people around the world, and furthermore, that the average footprint of the richest 1% of people globally could be 175 times that of the poorest 10%. Nevertheless, the poorest 10% of the Earth's population live overwhelmingly in the countries most vulnerable to climate change. Accurate or otherwise, this statistic only provides ammunition for the entrenched interests of the wealthy, who will never be motivated to solve the climate crisis, while they continue to profit from economic exploitation, born of ecologically callous economic systems. Systemic economic change is the only solution to the Anthropocene. Likewise, this cross-section of Bachelupi's works prompts us to recall that no matter what anthropogenic future we arrive at, its ravages will be written upon our bodies. Collectively, Bachelupi's novel bodily economies comprise a statement that our bodies are both our best means of comprehending the Anthropocene epoch, and the medium on which its traumas will inevitably be written. Since the solution to global warming is not to fix the world, it is to fix ourselves. Humans have risen to the challenge with varying degrees of success in Bachelupi's post-capitalist and post-apocalyptic diegetic worlds, such as the water knife. Now finally, taking a step back, when I wrote this paper in the form of an article about 18 months ago, it concluded with the following sentence. The extent to which Bachelupi's successive fictions will continue to explore the quiddity of bodily economies remains to be determined, and equally, it remains to be determined whether the world's economic systems will change in response to, or be forcibly reshaped by, the Anthropocene. However, I think now, in the wake of the Covid-19 pandemic, I'd have to rephrase this concluding thought in the present tense. So finally, I'd like to tie this paper's discussion of the role of bodies in the Anthropocene very explicitly into the conference theme of survival, and in doing so, hopefully end on a somewhat optimistic note. As we conclude, I want us all to reflect upon how we might learn to utilise the agency of our bodies to pivot towards survival in the Anthropocene. I have three suggestions in this regard, as displayed on the slide. Firstly, you can become vegetarian or vegan. Although some people accuse practices of ethical consumerism of being merely a form of virtue signalling, the fact remains that the more of us who make this small change to our lifestyle, the lesser impact agricultural practices will exert upon the environment. Secondly, as overpopulation is the principal driving factor of the Anthropocene, choosing not to have children, where you're able to, can be considered a new form of ethical practice in itself. I'd also suggest that you might not want to give birth to children, for the even simpler reason that they will very likely have to cope with some horrifying planetary conditions by the end of the century, such as those depicted in The Water Knife. Thirdly, you could join an environmental advocacy or protest group such as Extinction Rebellion, who, prior to the pandemic, were gaining a lot of press and who continue to do a lot of admirable work to try and wake our governments across the world up to the realities of the Anthropocene Epoch. Finally, remember that your body has profound agential power. Your everyday choices can help our species pivot towards a future which is far more survivable than the dystopian landscapes of Bachelupi's science fictional works. Otherwise, the speculative Anthropocenic visions which pervade his oeuvre will soon begin to become reality. Thank you.